Okay, we're back. I was saying before, we had our one three-day weekend until Thanksgiving, so let's do this. Just two months of straight, five days a week, work, working through this. Have we hit any issues so far? So I'm turning off the echo. Any suggested changes like for syllabus that would help working through the course of anything? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so that is whenever, so over here on the left side where it says like module one, two, three, um, that's what I was about to pull up, actually. Yeah, you're just right ahead of me. Is that module, so right now we're in module one, and all the reference material is in here. It's like notes and videos. And then I always put like things that you should focus on in the textbook. So like start with, chapter one is pretty short, just a couple of pages. But then in chapter two, it gets a little longer. So I give specific like what equations, which tutorials, or these are kind of like examples. And then here's like another example from chapter nine. But yeah. Oh, in what week? Oh, I see what you mean. Like the actual schedule of when we move on to module two. Um, I mean, that should be. It is, it is straightforward, because once we're done with a project in the module, then we move on to the next module. So now I'm, I'm trying to think, is there a way to keep that updated on the syllabus? somehow, or even like a like end of module one notifier on the calendar or something like that. That would be helpful. Um, yeah, something like that. You could make assignments in the class. Yeah. Assign the yeah, and then assign a reading, like have a reading assignment that yeah, my, so I've done that in the past, but um, if you assign it to the end of the module, then it's like, okay, I don't have to read it until then. Um, but really, it should be at the beginning of the module. But if you're reading as we're doing work, that's also okay. Um, and diff different people work differently. I like to, when I was a student, I would try to do the problem the best I could with whatever previous knowledge I had. And then when I got stuck, I would go and do the reading. Um, other people like to be completely prepared, like they don't like hitting a wall when they're doing something, so they like all the information kind of mapped out before starting the problem. Either way is fine. Um, my, mine's kind of the lazy way, of like I do less reading because I'm constantly trying problems rather than doing reading. Again. But yeah, like once we once we get to ooh, what happened there, that is not high enough resolution. One forty four. Why? What what would be the point of that? Once we get to 
So project one twenty two, that's the end of module one. Like once you once we turn this in, then we're moving on. The next day we're gonna start home module two and homework two. So that's kind of the, the marker right now. It's wherever a project gets turned in, module's over. Um, but yeah, it would help to have like a hey, we're done. Done with module one kind of mark marked out. I can even add that like on the calendar itself since it is a Google calendar. Yeah, and, I, and we were just talking about this, how um, these are the main kind of places to look at examples and like what kind of background material we need so far. And Right now we're working on homework one. I think we did the first problem last time, and then we can move on to the next couple of problems, unless there's anything else that someone wanted to bring up first. No news is good news. I'll walk around too, so if there is something that you don't want to announce to everyone, then we can get to it there too. Oh my god, it's Mendeley. All right, next problem is looking at vectors. Ho hopefully, mostly review, especially in this first chapter. Um, I'm just pasting in that problem. So take a second, how would you draw three vectors, RPO, RPQ, and RQP? How do you draw those three vectors? We have two points in space with one origin. How do I draw vectors connecting those points to each other, and which one's which?
I just did a quick lap through a little bit of the room. Um, usually the only sticking point is just either remembering or learning this notation. It's, I, people have told me like that PO, that they've written vectors in the opposite way, but then when I look at their textbook, it's always destination slash origin. So like, so, and I'm pretty sure every textbook that you've had should should say where you the the head of the vector with respect to the tail. Um, there might be like math books that switch it because why not? Um, but I, I'm pretty sure every single physics textbook that I've looked at is always destinations with respect to origin. Cool. So P slash Q, P with respect to Q, which one would that be? It's a line connecting P and Q, right? But if I'm trying to say R, P slash Q, where is the, t the head, like the, the triangle part? Where is that one? Where is it pointing at? It's at P. Yep. So P slash Q is pointing that way. What's special about Q slash P, P slash Q? There's something, there's like a math equation that we can relate, we can write for those two. This one, you're not asked to do this in the homework, but I'm trying to see where everybody's at. What's, the, what's special about PQ and QP? Something. They're exactly the same, but opposite, right? They're exactly the same, but opposite. So how would I write that as an equation? How could I say that this is the opposite of that? Yeah, so I could put a negative sign and say that if I know if I know the components of this, I can multiply each component by negative one, and then I have that one. Kind of nice. Best case is things are either proportional to each other, like F equals M A. F and A are always proportional to each other. That's nice. Even better is when everything's equal to zero. That's that's like all right. Things are things are looking up. Everything's coming up, Cooper. When everything's equal to zero, but proportional is fine. And this one's good. Equal and opposite, proportional. Review, new. Q's, no, Little big. <laughs> All right, so we got muscles here. We want a free body diagram of the barbell, not the person, just the barbell. That, at least this is what the problem, I'm restating the problem, because I just grabbed the image. So it's asking, what would be the free body diagram of that barbell? This one, I like to see how you approach it and then go through 
show what answers I saw from the class. Free body diagram. This is your main tool in every statics and dynamics kind of problem. What forces are there? How does that relate to motion? What's happening? No questions. So,
I saw someone write FH, and I like that one, because it could be the force of the human or the force of the hunk, because he's like, <laughs> like killing it in the gym. So this was, this was kind of the first thing that I saw, was that overall, there's some total weight, like two barbells, you could say the bar, some people consider the barbell as separate, like that's another 45 pounds. But like overall, there's a bunch of weight, and there's the force of our human, the hunk, like resisting that. And if it's not accelerating, then FH equals MG, right? So that was like option number one. And then another thing that I saw was kind of like, if you look at it from like a profile shot of this guy, from the side view, kind of, and that's kind of what this picture is showing us, right? Is that from the side, maybe his arm is creating, and I'll call it like a, like F arm, that his arm is creating some kind of force, but the weight is always pointing straight down. And one of the things that we were, that I was kind of discussing with people here is that overall, no matter what these two forces all are, reaction forces, like total force, like MA would have to be going like towards the person. As if it's like, if he's lifting it, it's like accelerating towards his crotch. Like not, that happens. It's, and it's hilarious, like hilarious when there's a crotch shot. But, but overall, like there's gotta be something else because He's not dropping the weight, like it's not falling towards him. So what I said, uh, my note for that kind of design was that there's got to be some kind of like 90 degree reaction force. So the, the hand itself is kind of supported by the body and those bones are not letting, not letting it come this way. So we, as he's pulling it up, there's kind of this like that um then the third thing that i saw and i'm just kind of drawing everything out to start is break this thing out into uh what do we want to call it? yeah we'll call it like f1 f2 w1 w2 and then there's even like the the barbell, like a, a B or some kind of barbell weight. So that was kind of the three things that I saw. Did anyone have a different approach or a different thought on that? Yeah. I mean, I have the same as the third one, but if you read the problem, it says a massless, like, bottom, massless bottom. Massless, so, like, yeah, yeah. the weight of the barbell, because it says two-point massless and a rigid massless bottom. Yeah, so in the problem statement, it does say that it's massless, but even if you do include it, you can always say this is mg, but m is zero. And so like, I included it. If I do want to add it later, then it's there. And if not, then I ignore it. Yeah, that was kind of the main three groups that I saw. Yeah, yeah in the reading is fundamental. If you read, sometimes it makes it easier. You can ignore some more forces that way. Are any of these more right or more wrong? Like, is there a group that did it right versus did it wrong? What do you think? Number three is the most sense. Yeah. Yeah, three. Three kind of breaks down, like, um, now you've got not only some of the forces, but also some of the moments kind of problem. Um, so here, all three are exactly right. Like there's no, when there's nothing wrong with doing any one of these. And because you're just asked to draw a free body diagram, it's not asking you to like set up equations to solve for some unknown force or something like that. But when you're drawing these, think about what kind of question can you answer with this free body diagram. So with problem one, what kind of question could I ask that I could get an answer to? What kind of like engineering question? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. If I want to know like how much force this guy needs to apply, this is all I need. I just need to know what is the total weight, and the only thing supporting that weight is the person. So total weight is whatever total force he's applying. And if that's the kind of question that I want to answer to start, then that's all I need, like, and I'm done. What about with like problem two? Now things are a little different. I can I can make like a little more nuanced questions, like get more details. What could I ask with problem two? Or like, for, sorry, not problem two, but yeah. Yeah, so I could start asking like questions about angle. So what angle the forces are applied, something like that, yeah. You could say what, how much force you need at that angle for its vertical component to exactly cancel. Yeah, so now, now I can start having, having a discussion of like, if I consider this person is like a, you know, like, if this is the angle, theta, I could start asking the question of, at 90 degrees, how much force is there versus at 45 degrees, how much force is there? And it's different. So if you've done kind of barbell lifts, you know that this is kind of the hardest part. Well, unless, I mean, you can get some momentum so that it makes it a little easier to swing through that, the biggest part. But if, but if you're just trying to hold muscles and you just hold the barbell out at this position, that's the hardest one versus like kind of leaning it like that, there's the least amount of muscle force. So you could start asking that kind of question. What about with number three, with free body diagram three? What kind of question could you ask there? Yeah, like the tilting, right? So here you could start saying like, all right, if the hands are equally placed, how much weight does each hand hold? Or if the hand is not equally placed, how much weight does each hand hold? The worst case would be like one hand directly in the center and the other hand somewhere not in the center, because now there's no stabilize, there's less and less stabilizing. Or the closer you get both hands to the center, the less moment you can apply with the same amount of force. So more instability that way. Cool. So it's a tool that helps you answer like engineering questions. They're set up these engineering questions. It's not just like, are the is your drawing like the prettiest or something? We're, in, we're engineers. We don't have to draw it pretty. We just got to get turn it into some math. And then 2.9, I think 2.9 is the bobsled, the luge model. So here we want to draw a free body diagram of someone on a luge course. Again, try it. And now you kind of know like the diagram is 
setting up some kind of engineering question, like what, what kind of equation do you want to set up in that sort? So think about it that way. Like, what kind of question do you want to ask? So how would you draw that result? And here, I, we weren't doing like two five, but you, it also might help you think about like how you draw that three by diagram if you're thinking about what coordinates and what question.
All right, so I'm kind of taking this third one, which I'll get, get us some more room so we can look at it. The third one is kind of my own uh, interpretation of what, what people were kind of discussing as I was walking around. So in, in number one, some people were just trying to figure out like, all right, well, how fast is this guy gonna go down a ramp? So if it's overall like a constant or over, or some kind of um, or some average angle, like an average slope that the person is accelerating down, then we could answer that question of like, all right, we know there's a normal force that prevents the person from crashing through the ice. At least it should be there unless it's melting or something. And then there's mg. So then the answer to the question is that there's some like g times that sign of the angle. But the bigger the angle, the faster we're moving. Something like that. I left out something that other people put in there. What else? Did anyone add other forces in here? In number one? Yeah? Um, friction. Friction. Like the force went down, basically, along the motion. What's the force along the motion, though? Like, I don't know. I guess if it got pushed at all. That if it's being be... pushed. But here, all his, his hands yeah, and feet are good. up off the ground. So he's not pushing it. Yeah? Um, I think our acceleration should be Acceleration? Yeah. So acceleration, there was, there was like one physicist, L'Hopital, who said negative ma, he, he would write that on his free body diagram. So you could write ma but in the negative direction on, on your free body diagram. But I think every other physicist puts that mass times acceleration in a different diagram that they call the kinetic diagram. Uh, so there, because right now, I'll, although I can add up these forces, um, I don't have I would have to say that they're equal to MA, but I can draw what is, what do I think MA looks like to start? And that would be something like this, where in my kinetic diagram, diagram, I would have like MA pointing directly down. So now I know the sum of these forces equals this vector, and it only has one direction. It's always going down the slope because we're not trying to launch the guy. There's no jumps, there's no like pitfall. It's not like Mario Kart, it's it's just constant ramp. Yeah. Well, can you say that the sled doesn't have its own suffering acceleration, but rather that it's just the result of gravity? So could you break that into some components? Um, so here, 
So I guess, yeah, walk me through what you're thinking. Is that gravity is acceleration somehow? Like, or? Like you could say, yeah, uh, MA, if it has like its own, if it, in its own sovereign name, acceleration from some external force, but it, maybe if it starts from rest and everything, making it move, it's gravity pulling it down the slope. So yeah. Acceleration would just be a component of gravity along that slope. Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. So that, and this is kind of what that's setting up for you. It's just starting from, from a agnostic point of view of like, I know, I know acceleration goes this way. I don't know what it is. And then I know MG is always pointing down. That one I do know, but I don't know N and therefore I don't know force of friction. So overall, and, and that's what, it's helpful, even in kind of a simple problem like this, like maybe you already know that acceleration is g sine theta or something, g sine theta minus mu and mg, mu g theta, cosine theta, anyway. But it helps to break it down this way of just saying like there's, I know the direction of stuff, I just don't know what those things are doing. And that's what we're trying to set up here. Is that MA equals this stuff. I don't know what A is until I go through and set up which components are causing A. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think of it as like a, almost like a crossword puzzle or a Sudoku thing. Like you set up all the blank spaces and then you start filling it in like a little kind of puzzle to put together like that. <laughs> Number two, I, I find this the most difficult one to draw, but I, I did see some people trying to get everything into one three-dimensional diagram, and I warned people that I'll try to draw it, but it's not going to look right. So here I've got like gravity, again, like going down, like some, it's vertically down. And then I've got some kind of normal force in a different direction, but then also like a a force from the wall. So not only is it accelerating down the mountain, but it's also going around a curve. So then there's some kind of centripetal acceleration because I'm, I'm accelerating, I'm changing my velocity along the slope and I'm changing the direction of the velocity. So again, this one, I have the, the biggest trouble drawing. So instead, usually I do a combination. Of like if I want to consider both, I say, all right, it's one plus three. Like here's the here's the profile shot and here's the cross section shot. It's like he's going down a slope and going around that banked curve, something like that. That's my approach. Um, if you like it, steal it, use it whenever you want. But here now I've got a similar kind of problem where I have mg pointing down and n pointing that way. It would look like acceleration is going to do something like there's non zero acceleration, right? Because total force is not zero. It can't be zero when you're up on a banked curve like that. So it has to be, there's got to be some kind of kinetic component that there's, or sorry, yeah, yeah, like a change in momentum somehow. And that is your V squared over R, that centripetal acceleration times mass. So if you were drawing this and kind of, if you were trying to do something that takes everything into account, sometimes it helps to break it into two parts. And, um, and this, is, this is the main part that, that you would need there, is that there's only two forces really acting on it. Uh, technically, you could have like force of friction pointing along the wall, because there is like a normal force Force of friction for steel on ice is on the scale of like one thousandth, like mu is the, the coefficient is like one thousandth of a thing. So if you have a normal force of a thousand pounds, there's only one pound of friction on it. That's why if someone like jumps on the ice, it's, whoa, it looks sli it's slippery because there's not much friction. Yeah. Up here, 
So in case one, I'm going to back up for a second. What's the max speed that you could get to if you could go down the mountain? Like, let's say you had like 20 miles of just constant slope. How fast are you going to go? You're going to go down, down a slope for like an hour. Something like that. How fast are you going to go? Depends on friction. Okay. We said friction's pretty small. So let's say, should we give it some numbers? Do you want to look at numbers and then calculate it? All right, let's do it. So a 10 degree slope, theta is pi over 18 radians. And we're going to go like, uh, let's call it two kilometers, like 2,000 meters along this slope. And we'll call mu, let's just call, ah. I don't know. Do you want to add friction or, or no friction? It doesn't matter to me. Neglect friction. neglect friction. Let's start off neglecting it since it's small. And then you can always add it in if you don't trust me that if you think friction is the big deciding factor. So we've got my MA is MG sine theta. So theta is pretty small, so you could just say MG times pi over 18. MG times pi over 18, that's my A term. So how fast, after 2,000 meters, how fast are you moving? Uh, we actually don't because we said mu is zero. Um, well, even yeah, even if we, we yeah, mass gets divided through no matter what. So yeah, we don't. Fifty kilogram, five hundred kilogram. It's all according to what we have. So what forces we have, no change. So how fast is it gonna go?
This ends up coming up a lot where you have to break up a vector into its two components. One, the mg sine component is along the slope, and the mg cosine is perpendicular to it. So that's why, that's why I quickly wrote out that ma. In grad school, we used to call this the magic arrow. I'm just like, here's a picture. And here's an equation, and it's like, well, what? Where did where did that come from? Um, so, this is the the intermediate step of that magic arrow is that I broke out this one vector pointing straight down into something that's perpendicular to the slope and parallel to the slope. Um, did anyone find number? How fast is this guy going? Yeah. 82.7 meters per second, 82. So like 80 meters per second. How's that sound? Does that sound right? How fast is that? How many miles per hour? Now, uh, yeah, I know you already gave a number, but 80 meters per second, roughly. How fast are you going? Yeah, like double it. Double, double that to get miles per hour. So you're doing 170 miles an hour, 160, 170 miles an hour. That's fast. Um, can you try out the you use the this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that one. So what we've done, kind of breaking this out, figure out what are the forces involved, find the force that's actually causing motion, now we know that A is constant. If A is constant, now I can use any kinematic equation. So the kinematic equation here is that Vf squared minus V0 squared equals 2A delta x. A callback or a throwback to a physics one kind of problem. Right? difference in velocity squared is that 2 times a delta x like that. And if we went further, if we double this, then, then our speed is going to not double. I guess if we made it four times longer, our speed would double. And if we make it, because it's square root of that, so four times that distance would double our speed. So now we're doing 300. 300-ish miles an hour, somewhere around there. It's fast. So if you go far enough, you're breaking the sound barrier. And if you go even further, I mean, at some point, it'll break speed of light just with a constant slope. Anything else that we could? Is there anything slowing it down? Like if we add friction, it'll slow it down a little bit, but it's still constant acceleration. Yeah. Air resistance, yeah. So one point that I wanted to make here is that friction 
slows down, like it'll change this number from an 80 to whatever, a 70, but it still keeps growing. It's still a parabolic, this is like a parabolic acceleration where the longer, the longer you ride that slope, the faster you go. There's nothing slowing it down. It's just changing the rate at which it's changing. Um, but if we add air resistance, now there's, some, now there's a new term that's air resistance is going to be proportional to speed squared. So the faster you're moving, the more air is pushing against you. So the last thing that you can add, it's like an F drag. where it's gonna be like proportional to V squared, that the faster, faster you move, the more resistance you have. Then you can answer the question, like what's the max speed, like what's the steady speed, speed or something, or max speed that you reach. And I'm just kind of rolling through. Now we can do some rocket science in the last couple of minutes that we have in the class. So we've got rocket lifting off the ground. It has uh, thrust, gravity, drag, and wind. Um, this, this is something that I, I don't have like an issue with it, but it, it's kind of weird to, to separate drag and wind since drag is a relative velocity through the air and wind is going to change what that relative velocity is. But it's OK to split it into two components, because that the wind is always going to be like a constant force. But your kind of drag along due to speed is going to always be pointed along the nose. I don't know. It's not a big deal, but it is kind of weird to think of drag and wind as two separate forces. But we can draw it that way. And then it says draw it as a point mass, what would be a diff, like, what else would you draw the rocket as? Why would it not be a point mass? What would not draw it? If it's a point mass, what does that change about how you draw this diagram? Yeah, yeah, so there's no moment involved, so, and, I like to start problems as point mass kind of problems. And then if, if it's not capturing the questions that I'm trying to ask, then start adding the fact that there's moments involved in how these forces are applied. So point mass makes it a little easier because every, everything is going through the center of mass of that rocket. So the wind is not creating like a, a twisting moment on the rocket or the thrust is not slightly off center and spinning the rocket in, in a weird way. So point mass. OK, 
Okay, so then we're drawing it during ascent. So it already took off off the ground. There's no there's no ground reaction forces on it. It probably would be like a left-right wind, since you usually, the only time you'd get upward wind would be some kind of weird weather, like tornado or hailstorm happening, where hail, hail the way it gets created is the rain keeps getting tossed back up, so there's like an upward wind. But if there's hail, you're probably not launching a rocket anyway. So it's probably just a gentle breeze, left, left or right. Yeah, yeah. Um, This is kind of what I saw so far. Does anyone have something different? I didn't see any like, big changes here. Nothing else. The only other thing that I have seen that kind of makes the problem also a little interesting is like, This is the only other like option that I that I have seen that, that makes it also like another just a different kind of problem where we've got gravity acting down, my thrust pointing up this way, and then the force of the wind is either pushing it along or or if it's a negative wind then just a negative one times that wind direction, and then drag 
drag is always in line with thrust. It's resistant. It's always resisting the thrust. That's the only extra thing that I've seen before. But didn't. But I'm supposed to draw it as a point mass. But do I have like moments created from these forces when I put it at an angle like that? No. Why not? Why is there? Uh, moments you need the distance between the points. So if it's all applied at the same point, you're not generating the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So everything. Like force of gravity, its moment arm is zero because it's right through the center of mass. The drag, as long as it's pointing along, like directly through center of mass, again, the moment arm is zero. Same thing for thrust, as long as the moment arm, it's not like off center from the center of mass, still no, still no applied like moment on the thing. So overall, some of the moments is still zero, so it's still like a point mass problem, even though I'm rotating this and changing where those vectors are all pointing. Yeah. Here, because we're like actually off the ground, then, then we can't have a normal force because it's not touching anything. Normal forces are like some kind of reaction force between the object and something that's preventing it from moving through a wall or the ground or, or something, like some kind of, con uh, what am I thinking of? Restricting its motion, a kinematic constraint. So reaction forces, or normal forces and reaction forces, they all come from constraints on motion. But right now, this thing can move in any direction. You can point it and thrust that way. So we don't have any constraints on that motion that, in that sense. At least kinematic constraints. It's not tied to a string. It's not, um, like it's not being blocked by a roof or something, like trying to get through the roof. Cool. And then we've got like a couple of minutes left. I think rather than jump into another thing, let's get some sunshine, get outside, and we can always come back another day. So like take five minutes, go soak up some sunshine, and then get to your next class. Thanks a lot. And if you do have questions, I'm still here. But um, yeah, we'll use up more time next some other time.